Thank you very much for, oh, should I, sorry, I'm standing here. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. We are going to talk about restoring forests with digital tools. To my side here is Asaga Ayal. He is part of the found initiative Plan for the Planet, and he will tell us how he did this amazing work with digital tools. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm Sagar. I have been working as um, CTO of Plan for the Planet for three years, and currently I'm uh, in the supervisory board of Plan for the Planet Foundation. And um, yeah, so first let me start with the history of Plan for the Planet, and then we will go into what we are doing today uh, to restore forests with digital tools. Plan for the Planet uh, was inspired by Vangari Matai. Uh, she's a Nobel uh, Peace Prize laureate who planted 30 million trees in 30 years in Africa. And uh, when Vangari Matai started the Green Belt Movement, th this was a huge movement in Africa to restore forests. And our founder, Felix Finkbeiner, he had a goal to plant one million trees in every country in the world. Um, and he, and he planted his first tree in 2007. That's how the Plant for the Planet movement uh, got started. Today, there are over 80,000 Plant for the Planet ambassadors who are planting trees around the world. So th these are actions that's happening on grassroots levels. But this is, not on, this is not just what we do. So we also speak in different events, conferences, and share the message of climate justice to the world. Climate justice for us means that while uh, there are people emitting a lot of carbon in global north, people in global south should be compensated for that. People in gl global south should benefit in some ways because they are living a life in poverty, without education, without good health care. Well, we in this global north, or we in Europe and America and China and other countries are emitting um, more emissions. And in uh, four events, um, our ambassadors have even spoken at the United Nations. Um, we have organized 1,500 academies. Uh, these are a day-long uh, workshops for young children, 9 to 14 years old, where they learn about what greenhouse gases are, what climate crisis is, what they can do from their um, uh, place where, as a student, or speaking with their parents, or involving their friends, and take take small actions um, to fight the climate crisis. And we have over 92,000 ambassadors uh, so far. So in this process of um, planting trees and educating children about climate crisis, uh, we called for a trillion trees in 2011. This was a time when we did not know how many trees there were in the world. It was estimated that there were around 400 billion trees um, in the planet. And we wanted, we just got a number that says, let's plant a trillion trees. We wanted the number to be a symbol. But today, we know that there are three trillion trees on, on our planet. So there have been research done, and we know that there is a room for additional 1.2 trillion more. And this space has been calculated, uh, taking into account uh, the places for people, livestock, and other, other farming. And when this news came in 2019, a lot of newspapers got into the um, name, and you might have heard of different campaigns to restore forests around the world. And it's true that trees are the only machines that capture CO2 in the most efficient way today. We know that there are different other technologies being built which are expensive and which are something that we need to invest, but trees are one of the most effective ways to capture, and it's a natural solution to capture carbon dioxide. And you might have also heard that uh, the former US President Donald Trump also wanted to plant a trillion trees. And he actually launched a campaign in 2020 uh, and co worked together with the World Economic Forum to launch an initiative in the US to, to invest in this. So there is a lot of political interest. It's becoming um, not only as a movement where we want to restore forests, but trees are also being politicized recently. Um, so this is a, a very interesting graph. So in these three blocks, you see very equal, almost the same amount of forest. And the one is the first um, 9,000 years, between 8,000 BC and 1900, where we lost about 0 0.9 billion hectares of forest. And this almost the same amount of forest we lost in the last 100 years. Right? And the other number is what we can restore back. So what we are trying to do with the trillion trees is just trying to restore the trees that we lost in the last 100 years. 
And every year we are losing about 10 billion trees. So that is a quite huge number. So um, we have to do something, right? So where do we begin? So this is, um, again, the forest restoration potential. So the question is, where do we begin? Um, and when restoring forests, we also have to think of biodiversity. We have to think of how we minimize the cost effects and how do we uh, take into account the climate crisis and its impact on people living in different parts of the world. So the red that you see is where um, the impact, um, the effect of uh, biodiversity loss or climate crisis is the highest. So we have to keep into mind that we have to think of the people living in these areas. We have to think of the biodiversity. We have to think of the nature. We have to think of the social cost, et cetera, in this, in this reason. And also with the restoration priorities, we have to think why we need to invest in restoration in these areas. So you see most of the places where we need to have the highest priority is in Global South. Of course, there are places, Germany is also losing forests. There are countries in Global North losing forests, but majority of the places where we need to restore are in Global South. And trees, also, restoring these forests also brings us to think how can we uplift the economic standards of people living in these areas, right? Because most of the people living in these places make less than a dollar a day. And I think this is where our solutions really have um, an impact. And as we have been an organization where we started planting trees ourselves and educating uh, children, we started a project in Mexico where we tried to understand how we could restore forest ourselves at a larger scale. And this is the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where we started a project in 2015. We are restoring, we have restored almost over 9 million trees um, in this uh, region. Uh, this, uh, this is one of the lands, um, uh, a picture from 2021. Um, uh, where we, um, before we planted um, some trees. And this is um, our workers uh, who plant trees um, in the planting season. And this was um, the last America 7.1 after restoration. So in the last years, we have planted over 9 million trees, and we are still learning from how we could scale up restoration because we need additional 10,000 projects with a goal of each 100,000, one million, planting 100 million trees each to reach the goal of um, a trillion trees, right? So it's not a simple goal, so we need to scale up whatever we're trying to do. And equally, for restoration, it's also important to source native seeds, because of course anyone can plant a tree. I can get a tree and plant it somewhere. But the most important thing is sourcing the right species for the right place. If we plant invasive species, I'm sure you've heard of stories where invasive species have affected um, the biodiversity, it has affected um, forest. One of the things is when we plant trees that are not native to the place, biodiversity does not come back. And this is very, very crucial. If we want to see a forest where birds come back, where animals come back, we want to bring back the native species. And this is why in our restoration project this year, we are sourcing more than 30 different species, native species, so that we could restore the forest back to what it was like 30 years ago. Um, and um, we also started our own nursery, and this is also very important because when you are planting trees at a very, very large scale, you need to be able to build the infrastructure to be able to support that reforestation. In many parts of the world, this is very difficult. Uh, when you are especially planting trees, maybe a tree uh, in your garden or something like that, you can go to a nursery uh, next to your village or next to your city and get, get some trees. But if you're restoring trees at a scale of millions of trees every year, you need to be able to build that infrastructure. And I'll get back to why I'm getting to all this in a bit. And as we're trying to learn from all these processes, how we build nurseries, how we restore forests, we also learn from things. For example, this is a picture where um, one of the areas we reforested got flooded. And there are risks for the work that we are doing, and we need to be able to learn from them. Right? So there are forest fires happening in different parts of the world, hurricanes, and we need to be able to understand how climate crisis is going to affect the places that we are going to restore. Because some places, and this is according to the research from 2020, it's better to not restore some places because the impact of climate crisis is higher if certain places are restored. 
So we really have to look into the science behind where is the right place to restore forest. And um, in the 2021, we planted about 1.7 million trees in just under six months. Um, this was uh, between, yeah, in between the COVID pandemic. Um, in the previous years, we did a little more than 2 million trees, but uh, still be amongst the pandemic, we managed to uh, ourselves restore 1.7 million trees, and we have about 89 reforesters and altogether 128 team members working in Mexico restoring um, the Yucatan Restoration Project. Um, but forest restoration is not the only thing that Plant for the Planet is doing. Uh, we are also trying to protect existing forests. And this is equally important that when, if we want to stop um, deforestation, we need to be able to protect these areas because the damage to the, the, the environment and biodiversity is even more when these forests are cut down because the animals then would not have a place, the birds would not be coming back, right? So it's equally important that we think of forest conservation. Um, and um, some of the impacts that you can see here is these are the animals that we managed to capture um, in the forest that we've been protecting uh, with the local, uh, local government. And these are all very rare uh, species uh, in the region that we've been able to see in, in the forest. Um, but we know that now it's important to uh, restore forests, it's important to build nurseries, it's important uh, to conserve forests. The goal is how do we scale it up? So Plant for the Planet in the last um, eight, nine years has, has been learning how we, we restore forests in one single, single uh, place. And we've been building infrastructure uh, to support ourselves because as we learn new things, how we can uh, better manage the nursery, how we can better scale the reforestation, how we can better track trees, uh, we have come with a solution and that is the Plant for the Planet platform. And the Plant for the Planet platform is a free to use, open source, commission free tool where there are 120 plus projects. Um, and this is a platform where Plant for the Planet takes no single commissions for donations that you give to all these different restoration projects. And I'm gonna explain you how these projects can come here and how we make this available to the world and why we do it. So the green um, bubbles that you see are a list of projects around the world. Uh, you can see projects in almost every uh, continent. Uh, where humanity lives, and the blue projects are co uh, conservation projects where organizations are working together to conserve existing forests. Uh, when you come on the platform, uh, you have options to see, and this is something we're trying to make it easy for people to understand because scientific data, usually researchers, it's really difficult to understand it. So we try to make it simple where you can see what's the deforestation like in the last 20 years. Where in the world can we restore forest? So this data is publicly available and very easily available on the platform. And um, as uh, users come on the platform, we also make it um, uh, easier for them to track the trees, to track the donations, to track the tra tax deduction receipts, right? And to be able to invite people, engage community and plant more trees. Um, but that's not where we um, end. We want to make sure that when, if you're supporting certain projects, you also want to see the impact of what's happening, right? And for restoration projects, one of the key challenges is they are doing the hard work on the ground and most of these restoration organizations don't have the IT infrastructure. They don't um, have the right people to share their work and to share where they're working. And this is from our experience. Before we started our own project in Mexico, we were supporting different projects with the donations that we received from people who said, hey, you're plant for the planet, we want to give you money, um, please give it to people who plant trees. And we did do that. And one of the difficult things that we found out is people usually say, we planted trees in this hill, in this place. And it was just that. So it was really difficult for us to identify and track how the forest there is progressing, how the restoration work is progressing without us actually going and visiting there, which incurs a lot of cost. So um, this is um, available for all projects, free of cost. Projects can upload their polygons. Um, they can actually use TreeMapper app, which I'll get back to, to collect additional data. And on the right-hand side, you see what we call a time travel feature. So we are trying to use um, publicly available uh, data set, um, high resolution imagery. Um, we also use Landsat uh, and Sentinel data to show how the forest was um, before um, the restoration work happened and how it is today. So you can go to the application, um, ch change the dates, change the um, 
satellite providers and see how the forest um, is changing. So we're trying to make it really accessible for anyone to see um, how the restoration work um, is evolving on the ground and also to be able to analyze all these different sites uh, so that restoration organizations don't have to set up complex tools, uh, pay um, hundreds of uh, th thousands of euros uh, to, to set up tools like this. And this is available for free of cost. And this is also a way for them to share their story in a standard format where they can say this is where we're restoring and this is the main region we're restoring. Um, so since um, we have a way for um, the organizations to share um, uh, their work, we also built a donation gateway, and this is actually how we started. We wanted to build a tool so that we could fundraise to, to plant a trillion trees. And uh, today, uh, we have built a, a tool that companies, individuals, influencers can use to engage their community. You can go to the platform, you can build your own forest, you can invite your family. If it's your birthday, you can create a donation link that's custom to you, which says dedicated to this person, and you can share that link to everybody so when people go and donate, your forest grows together, right? So here you can see um, Bleniklum. Um, she uh, joined together and planted uh, 40,000 trees with us, and she has her own forest. So we build technology so that this can be multiplied. If there's somebody who wants to engage, these tools are available for free for individuals and influencers. And the way we're able to finance this platform is by asking companies to invest in us, basically to support us so that we can build these open source tools and make it available for free of cost for restoration organizations and individuals. And on the second, you can see um, uh, Jane Goodall. Um, we organized a campaign, uh, Trees for Jane, um, uh, in the last year, and the other is just a normal version of the donation platform where you can donate with different, uh, different methods. And along with um, donations, we also offer uh, leaderboard and trackings. Um, so here you can see, this is uh, Salesforce Forest. You might have heard of the company Salesforce, uh, which is one of the leaders in CRM uh, companies. Uh, Salesforce uses Plant for the Planet uh, uh, platform to empower their uh, employee engagement tool. Um, and on the, right hand, uh, on the left hand side, you can see a forest from uh, Sat1, the TV channel. Uh, we organized uh, together Wald Record Voca, where Plant for the Planet provided the digital tools um, to uh, collect donations and to count uh, the forest. And 1.4 uh, million trees were planted in five days. And one million tree was just planted in one day uh, during the entire week. Um, but now, when people are giving money, the question comes transparency, right? How do we account? How do we make sure the trees are planted? How do we make sure the forest is protected? And this, is, this was one of the biggest um, questions that we've been trying to solve since we started working on digital tools. This is something, uh, in, in our restoration project, we had um, a seat where people fill out. This is the number of trees we planted today, uh, different species, different counts, and those used to be filed. But and we know that many organizations have these filing tools, but when those records are just filed and not shared, the donors have no idea what's going on. So we wanted to change that, and we built a very simple tool uh, called TreeMapper. Basically, what TreeMapper allows is, TreeMapper allows restoration organizations to walk around the area they planted, take pictures of the place where they're planting trees, and after they're done collecting the polygon, um, they can walk into the area where they planted trees and take sample pictures. So if, you plant, if an organization planted about 5,000 trees, they can take a sample of maybe 1% or 10 trees or 20 trees every single day. So it's, they're not counting 5,000 trees because that would be insane lot of, a lot of work and that would cost a lot. So we want to reduce that. But at the same time, if we're collecting a sample data, for example, information about uh, 10 trees every day, and the, the information contains height, um, um, breadth, the species, uh, and a, a full-size picture, that information can be managed over large sample size. So if you're planting for six months straight, if we just uh, create a sample of, let's say, 1,000 trees, we would be able to identify what percentage of trees in that planting season survived. So we're able, to, um, we're able to gather information about uh, mass plantings without actually collecting the data. And this is how a lot of scientific research works. And I, I think this is something you're aware with. You always work with sample size. 
And um, along with the sample collecting, we also want to allow restoration organizations to create monitoring plots. And our goal is we don't know yet if planting trees actually makes a dent in climate crisis. And this is a, this is a question because, of course, we know trees capture carbon, but we don't know if the place where we are restoring is actually something we should have restored. So what monitoring plots allows us to do is understand how certain areas behave. So we have uh, different methods of creating monitoring plots, and one plot, uh, we just leave it around to, s to see if new trees uh, grow up there automatically. And on the other hand, we plant certain trees in some plots. So we analyze those uh, plots over the course of years to identify whether the restoration work we did even made a dent um, to, to something that we wanted to do, or if trees grew naturally in the other part of the plot. So this is something we're making accessible for all restoration organizations. This is a feature that's going to come out later this year. Uh, we've been working with monitoring plots for the um, last few years, and I think this is going to help us understand how um, forest restoration work of different organizations and different projects help, um, the, help the climate or help the, the ecosystem or the bring back the forest in different areas. And again, TreeMapper is free of cost, um, no cost associated for anybody. Um, so once the TreeMapper collects data, um, of course, a lot of these projects are working in places where Wi-Fi does not exist and trees don't give Wi-Fi. So once they come back to um, their uh, base, it, sometimes this happens once a month, sometimes this happens every day, um, the phone uploads the data automatically. So here on, the, um, on this side, you can see little boxes. So these are daily plantings. Um, sometimes we plant on top of each other, so this really depends on uh, planting uh, goals. Because sometimes you're planting one species and you leave the space for other species, so you come back and plant another species in between. Um, and you can see the sample trees, which are small dots. And th this is a feature that you can go to Plant for the Planet website and check it uh, real time. Uh, what, and I only took this screenshot yesterday, so the plot that says six days ago was just planted six days ago. And all these pictures that you see, and on the uh, left-hand side, that's a sample tree where we have a picture. Um, it's from August 14, it's tagged. So if you happen to go to that location any day, you can check whether that tree still lives or not. And our employees who have the TreeMapper app can go there and remeasure this tree at any time. So we actually plan to remeasure 50% of the sample trees that we have registered. And we, the software is basically going to randomly ask uh, the users to say, go back and remeasure 50% of the trees in this region. So it will basically give them a list. And this feature is coming out next month. So we want to really make sure that we collect the data about what the survival rate is. And especially in this area where we are restoring, it's a really difficult uh, soil to restore. It's called leptosoil. Uh, and leptosoil. And sometimes we're planting two or three saplings to see if one of them survives, right? So we are kind of trying to experiment with how we can increase uh, the survival rate of trees in different, different soil environments. But what TreeMapper really helps us get is it helps us to get the analytics on how we can succeed. What's the right kind of species for right kind of soil type? And so while TreeMapper helps us collect data from the ground, sent by the restoration organization, we also want to make sure the projects are actually not only planting trees with the right standards, but also contributing um, and to different sustainable development goals and making sure that there's a fair ways paid to employees and it's whatever they're trying to do, it's not just uh, monoculture or something like that. So um, this year, um, in, we, we managed to review over 40 projects by visiting this project. So this was something we tried to avoid in the early days because we wanted to reduce the cost of somebody traveling in the uh, areas. We wanted to work on the trust system and we wanted to build tools. But at the same time, we want to ensure that when people come to the Plan for the Planet platform, uh, make a donation and support, or for companies who want to make this decision to invest uh, or to, to uh, contribute to these projects, we want to make sure that the projects are receiving the best support to become the best restoration projects in the world. So we, are, we have uh, uh, ecologists who are visiting these different projects, um, rating these uh, projects on different uh, criteria. We have also published um, our standards 
for the minimum standards to be on the plan for the planet platform and the top standards of what an ideal restoration project should be like. How should that project um, uh, think of biodiversity, think of a community, think of society, and things like that. So um, we, are, we are planning to scale this up so that every single project we have on the platform will be um, uh, yeah, will be reviewed on site by somebody from the Plan for the Planet um, or other ecologists um, who are uh, part of our uh, review team. Um, and along with uh, the monitoring, we also want to help developers and app builders to scale with our technology. So we have a technology where people can come, donate, where we have, where uh, restoration organizations come, collect um, uh, donations. But at the same time, there are hundreds of applications who are planting trees or who are looking for a way to engage the audience. And we've, we've been working on a product called PlanetCast APIs. So one of the challenges that we found is whenever you pay for something on the internet, and I, I think you also noticed like booking a ticket for this conference, there was a two euros fee extra. Right? So in every transaction, there is a fee. Like one of the uh, famous um, uh, um, merchants, for example, PayPal, takes about 40 cents if you make one euro donation. And this is really expensive. So if people want to plant one tree, 40 cent of that goes to PayPal. And we want to stop that. And especially when companies are trying to do that on large scale and they want to engage their uh, employees, that they want to engage their customers, every transaction counts because every 40 cent counts. So we try to build an API for microtransactions where people can automate. If there is an order on a SOP, you can automate with our APIs and plant a tree. So a code is going to be sent, a personalized email or personalized certificate. The company can decide, or we send an email saying, hey, here's your code. This is where your tree will be planted. And this is something we're trying to um, uh, make it work this year uh, or early next year. We call status of the tree. So since we have the tree mapper data from the projects working on the ground, and we have the donation and the individualized, we will be able to offer you updates on where your tree is approximately planted. So we will be able to pinpoint your tree in one single area, and we'll be able to um, share with you what's the survival rate, how, what percentage of tree um, are living there, and over the course of time, you can see with satellite imagery that we have how, the, how your forest is actually growing. Um, and um, these are uh, two companies uh, who have worked with us in the past, the uh, uh, PCM Academy. Uh, they've been uh, using our systems for the last um, six months, and um, for every um, person who buys something on their uh, website, they send out an email saying, hey, here's your tree. So all these individuals will be able to see where their forest is down the road. And the end of the company we worked with is Digame during the Sat Eins uh, Waldrecht Woche. So there was an option where people texted Baum Eins, Baum 5, or uh, Baum 10. And that SMS that you sent was connected to our APIs, so we were able to get back to you and, hey, this is a code to track your individual tree. So the good thing is you don't, a company does not have to share personal information to us. They just have to say, we're planting one tree for this person. And if the user who received that code wants to come back to Plant for the Planet platform, view their tree, create a profile, they're welcome to do so. But you don't have to share any private information with us. So it's very, very data, data secure in that, uh, in that case. And this API is available for, um, in beta right now for individuals free of cost. For companies, there might be some cost associated with it, but uh, we're trying to make sure that we create an opportunity where we can continue to invest on the platform and grow well. Um, companies can help us uh, scale that. Uh, but that's not all. So in the beginning, I also told you that we are uh, collecting seeds. So. Um, as we build a platform to engage um, restoration, we're also thinking, yeah, we, we're building an app called Seed Manager. And it's, it's, for us, we realize that it's really important to identify where we can source seeds from. And usually, uh, the process that we found out was um, some of um, our employees in Mexico, they, they go looking for a forest called, where we call mother trees, a tree where we can source seed from. So we track if some seeds have already been taken from that tree, if there are uh, seeds in that tree. So this helps, us not only, this helps not only us, but a global network of reforesters and organizations to identify different um, trees and where they can source seeds from. So this is basically going to be a global seed database where restoration organizations can or anyone who has knowledge about ecology can say, hey, there's a tree, somebody can come and collect, and they can use the Seed Manager app. 
Uh, we are still uh, working uh, on the app, so this might not be ready by next year, or th this will be ready by mid next year or so. So um, in addition to all these tools that we're building, uh, we also um, started our work on Empowerment and Restoration Research Park. It's important that when we think of um, restoration, it's not like if a project does not meet the criteria, we kick them off and say goodbye, right? Because we know that all these organizations are working hard to be the best in restoration work because we do a vetting and a lot of these are people who are motivated to work on climate crisis. And most of the time, the reason why they don't have the right tools is because they don't have access to the right resources. They don't have access to the right people who can help them get better. So this is something we're starting in uh, Mexico, but we're also expanding with our team um, who is visiting uh, different projects around the world, where if we find that certain project does not meet certain criteria, we help them. We, we say, okay, you're not good at this, but let's help you get better. So we're building a rest empowerment re restoration research park where we work on science. We, we research um, and research and identify what's the best way. How do we reduce the life? How do we make sure that some seeds are grown up in six months instead of three years uh, that usually takes, right? Identifying the right soil type, things like that. And we want, to, um, we want this to be a place where we um, provide restoration advice uh, for all these projects um, for free of cost. So um, to, to share um, in detail, our flywheel is um, we want to uh, use um, cutting edge science. Um, we want to make sure restoration is high quality. And we want to do large scale field experiments because usually um, in the past, large scale restoration has only been done as campaigns where individuals go and plant trees, but we want to bring um, establishment into that in a way that restoration organizations can manage how these things are done. The next is we want to ensure uh, documented transparency. So you saw what TreeMapper is capable of. You, you saw what we want to do with Seed, uh, seed Manager. Similarly, we want to be able to identify fire alerts, right? So if there is a potential fire threat, we want to be able to inform um, the organizations immediately because we know where they're planting trees. Um, so we want to build tools like this so we can engage the global community and provide um, um, uh, transparency in every step. And the next is, um, glo yeah, we want to make sure that everybody gets uh, restoration advice, especially people working on the ground, because it's important that, especially if we are giving the money, if we're investing in these projects, these projects work the best and we should help them. And the next is continuous improvement. We want to make sure that we go monitor and we verify these projects, we review, and we share these reviews again publicly on the platform. Um, and this is some statistics. So in 2020, um, Plant, for the Planet, um, Plant for the Planet had several projects in Mexico. So we received about uh, 3.8 million trees on the platform. And remaining uh, projects, the other projects received about 6.5 million trees. And in 2021, we received a share of 6 uh, million trees and 45 million trees went to other organizations. So that's also we saw 600% increase in the growth. And this is just trees. We just a few months ago, we started work on conservation projects, and we want to bring more ecosystem types. We want to look into ocean. We want to look into mangroves and different other methods of restoration. But we need to get better. Uh, we need to understand those concepts ourselves so we can build restoration standards. We can build different tools to support um, those uh, initiatives. Um, and again, this is the financial uh, reports from uh, 2020, uh, till 2020. Uh, Plant for the Planet's administrative cost is around less than 5%, and uh, most of our work either goes in trees or empowering uh, children um, across the world. Um, and as we grow, the percentage is becoming, it's becoming more and more clear that the majority of our um, uh, funding is going to trees so that we can help restore forests um, around the world. Uh, you can use the platform by visiting pp.echo um, or going to plantfortheplant.org um, and all these tools are available for free of cost for individuals. Thank you. And I would be open for any questions. Perfect. Thank you very much. Who has a question? No? Perfect. Um, my, 
excellent question is, wouldn't it be just enough to like leave grounds where the, plant, where the, where the trees grow themselves? I mean, how much human help is needed for, in, in Europe usually you have a space and after a while there's wood. That's a, that's a very, very good question. And that's also something we are trying to understand with monitoring plots. And that's one of the goals, because we want to know if there is a reference forest nearby, right? It depends where you are restoring forest. If you're restoring next to a forest, chances are the seeds fall and new trees grow. But if you're restoring in place where there's been um, farmland for 20 years and now it's a barren land, maybe the forest is not anywhere near. So you need to create a new forest, at least so that the forest can grow. But again, it really depends on the place. It needs, we need to identify these places, and that's where monitoring plots really help us understand if it made sense to even plant or restore trees. That sounds really good. If you guys, I have some questions. So do you guys plant all the seeds manually, or are you also looking into like drone seeding and stuff like this? So um, in the platform, most of the projects work uh, with individuals. Um, we do not uh, plant with drones yet. Um, one of the reasons is also because the land, the land type that we're working uh, in Mexico is really difficult with drones because we need to be able to really dig something and, and put, the, put the seeds. But also we're working on a large scale. So it could work that we could build drones, but again, it really depends on the cost. Did I look? No. Yeah. It really depends on the cost. Um, so, of course, we'd love to explore with different technologies. Um, we always see that there is potential to scale up. But for us, if we are putting drones in different countries where people don't have uh, annual income, we also think of restoration as a way to um, empower the community to give, provide jobs, right? And one thing I can think of is, let's say we're restoring some forest in a global south country where people don't have a good salary. If we planted, let's say, uh, 10 million trees and all of them die, let's say the worst case scenario, we still created jobs, we still provided people with economic livelihood so that they don't have to travel somewhere else, they can be with their family. And I come from a country in Nepal where majority of the people go to the Middle East. And in the villages when I go back, in the places I was born, the only people I see are people above 60. And all the young people are abroad. So if we can create certain jobs or some way so that they can stay in the places, we can think of how these countries and these places can develop, right? So we really have to think of not only trees as trees, but also as how we are thinking of society and socioeconomic uh, standards in different places. That sounds really lovely. Yep. Otherwise, I also have some questions, I guess we can. Uh, so, sorry. Also, specific issues. I once heard that there is like a quite big importance for forests and climate change and the water circle. So actually we need forests that bring the water from the seaside to the inner places of the, of the continents, more or less. And I expect that the regions close to the seasides are more expensive. And I'm just wondering how, much you are, how close you are connected to science. And if you would do an effort to perhaps like pay for more expensive grounds, if this would be doing good for climate change or against climate change? Again, very good question. Um, one thing I think is really important is, so when we go and restore forest, there's two questions. One about the land rights, right? So should somebody buy land to, to restore forest? In some places it might make sense because owning some land means you can uh, ensure that nobody else is cutting trees. But at some places, it might actually give the opposite effect of what we're trying to do. So in some places, it might actually be better to work with community to restore existing lands. Because if, let's say, an European uh, person or a European company goes in Global South and buys all the land in the name of restoration, what are we creating? Right? We have to really think of this. And I understand that it might look like, okay, we want to create the European standard or we want to create the American standard, we make sure everything is in place, but who is owning the land 50 years from now? So we really need to think of this. And I think um, in, in your case, if we work with communities and there are hundreds of projects uh, who are working in the forest side, planting mangroves, and these are all community-based projects, right? They're not owning the land, they're, they're planting, they're working with the community. And for community, it's like, it's their forest. And in many parts of the world, 
people look at forest like God. So I, I come from, uh, a, like I was grown up in a culture where I, planting two trees um, as trees that give shade is something that you do as, um, when you grow up so that it's a legacy of your life, right? So people are embedded with forest in different parts of the world and with different cultures. And I think it's about engaging the local people so that they understand why it's important. And I think the most important thing is if we go and try to help them find what they need, that would be the best way to start. And I absolutely understand that uh, there are places close to the forest where it's important. There are also places where people have cut down trees in the middle of uh, nowhere, far, far away from the ocean. But I think when it comes to restoration, it's about finding the right place uh, where it's possible and where it's absolutely needed. I think that it's a really, really good end. Thank you very much, Sagar. It thank was you. really a lovely presentation. And thank you also for the stream people and everybody here. And I think we can give you a round of applause for that. That was really lovely.